Yes, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I am your host for tonight, Mary Jane Calderon. I'm coming to you live from my office in Beringer Crawford Museum. We have a great presentation for you tonight, but before we get started, let's thank those that make this program possible. Um, let's see, Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of Beringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. We are supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Kentucky Humanities, sorry, let me admit some more people, Humanities and Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph E. Hale Jr. Foundation, and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining for access to discounts and exclusive programming. Learn more and join at bcmuseum.org. Now let's go over a few reminders. Everyone's microphone has been muted, so we can all focus on the presentation. Feel free to turn off your video if you prefer. Otherwise, others on the call are able to see you even when the screen is being shared. If you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat feature and we will try to get to as many questions as possible immediately following the presentation. Also, there's gonna be a quiz question tonight. The first respondent to enter a correct answer in the chat on Zoom or Facebook Live will win a Northern Kentucky History Hour pin and bragging rights, of course. So let's go ahead and meet tonight's speaker. Hillary Delaney just celebrated her 10th year at the Boone County Public Library's Local History and Genealogy Department and is the current president of the Boone County Historical Society and a proud Kentucky Colonel. In her professional life, she writes, researches, and shares local history with the public through programming, displays, articles, websites, and blogs. Many of the projects she has been involved with have received local, state, and national recognition. Hillary also has a special connection to the Little Britain Carriage House. It is owned and operated by her cousins, and she joins other family members in the operation of its events. So welcome, Hillary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Jane, and thank you all for joining. I'm so excited to do a presentation that I do have such a personal connection to. So I'm really excited to share some things with you about this wonderful, unique uh, place that a lot of people don't even know about. You want me to go ahead and share my screen? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. We will go ahead and get started. I am going to pull up this so everybody can see these wonderful treats we have in store. All right, when I was naming this um, program, I had a hard time because there's so much in this building. I was trying to be clever, but all of these things are there. So I called it Flocks, Locks, Arrowheads and Antiquities. And it is a unique event space. Um, it is on a horse farm uh, in Burlington on Idlewild Road. And if you've ever been to the Boone County Fair or England Idlewild Park, it's just past there. Um, so that's where we are located. And I just wanted to start this by giving everybody a brief history of how this place came to be. So my uncle, Charlie England, uh, purchased this farm um, back in 1979. And they purchased it actually because their farm that was on Price Pike was, um, was uh, bought by the Spanning Airport Project. They were out near where the um, tower is. So their farm is completely gone. And when uh, that purchase happened, um, Charlie found this property and the old house on the property, you can see, um, if you can see my cursor, it's up Hillary, here at the top. Is, sorry, I want to interrupt you. We're not seeing your screen. It's not being shared. You're not seeing my screen. No. Hmm. I wonder why that is. Let me try it again. Oops. Let me get in there. There we go. Now, tell me if you can see this. Yes, now we're seeing Wonderful, it. okay. So this is um, an aerial, two aerial shots of the Little Britain Farm and Carriage House because I wanted to show everybody kind of how um, this place has grown, what they started with and, and where this building is. And so uh, Charlie England purchased this farm on Idlewild back in 1979. And um, you can see in the picture on the left-hand side of the screen, um, there is a little house. It's kind of grainy, but the house is sort of near the top of the picture. And there's a couple other outbuildings, just a little barn. And there was actually an old silo that looks like a circle on your screen, but it was a silo that the top has, uh, was missing because of a tornado. Um, so that's what the farm looked like in 1974. 
And now, um, if you look at the aerial view on the right hand side, you can still see the, the house at the top. Um, this was an original little outbuilding as was this little outbuilding, a much clearer picture. No problem. I was, I was really just recapping kind of um, what the farm looks like now versus before. And if you see this, um, this building that has a star on top of it, that's the current carriage house. And then there's a parking lot that was added. And all of this horse stuff was added after they bought um, this farm. So um, when you come up to this building from the entrance, uh, the main entrance to the main hall, it's an attractive building, but it's, it's very unassuming. So it, it doesn't really give you a whole lot of um, preparation for what's inside. So it's kind of a surprise to a lot of people when they come in. So um, Charlie started collecting uh, the things that you'll see um, that are housed in this building in the early 60s. And he started with court, uh, horse collars and hames. You can see a few on the walls over on the picture on the right. Um, and he was just interested in those uh, because they were things that he thought were cool from his horse business. And then it, he expanded into a whole bunch of categories of antiques and collectibles. Did a lot of research on the things that he collected and um, was, had a really good eye. He really got good deals. <laughs> um, he started moving on to clocks and watches and you'll see the clock collection is pretty vast in, in the carriage house. Um, as he started to grow this collection, I think he began to realize that he needed a place to put it all. So he built this building and it was completed in 1989 and he used it not just to display his things and show people his collection, but he also used it for private parties and family gatherings. So it already had that history um, from the beginning. When Charlie passed away in 1997, um, his legacy really is, is what you see when you come in this building. Um, there were so many interesting items. It was just really hard um, to decide how to clear this out enough to make it into a business, which is what Phyllis England, who was Charlie's widow, wanted to do with this space, to share it with the public, but also make it a usable space that made sense to keep there on the farm. Um, so she turned it into an event hall and uh, had to have three or four auctions lots of private sales just to clear it out enough to make space for all the tables you see here and the people. Um, and she added the parking lot and the floors and then brought uh, you know, accessible bathrooms and everything up to code for a business purposes. And now um, it's owned and operated by the sun. And so why is it called the carriage house? It's not really a carriage house but um, it does have carriages in it. <laughs> Charlie collected antique carriages and cars. And we have a lower level in the building that is um, not decorated this way. It's more of a, a sort of a blank slate sp event space for smaller parties. Um, but that was originally where he kept all these carriages and cars. It used to have a garage door that you could put up, um, which has now been changed to a solid window. But so we saved a few of these um, carriages for really, they're kind of like backdrops um, for weddings and parties. A lot of people get their pictures taken in front of them. Um, the one you see on the right hand side that's an open buggy is often used for people's wedding gifts that they're put in there. And then you see the one um, that's down on the lower left corner. That carriage was used for years during wedding um, ceremonies. And we had that Clydesdale on the farm who used to pull it, but she is now retired. Um, the, the one that is the brome that's in the upper left-hand side um, is a really, really nice piece. It's circa 1900. Um, it's, it was hard to get a picture of the interior for you, but it has some of the original upholstery. It has handles by the windows for people to hold on when it's a rough ride. It's a really neat piece. And then there's a little salesman sample. that's like a scale model of a buggy and that sits um, on top of one of the display cases. So uh, it's a really interesting um, interesting thing to have in your, in your backdrop of your party. The clock's such a big thing in Charlie's collecting life. I wanted to add a little disclaimer that I'm not an expert on clocks. <laughs> I know how to research, but I know there are a lot of people out there who collect clocks who know so much more than I do. So I, I gathered a little bit of incidental identifying information. Um, and that's about all I know. So if you have questions later, you can always email me 
and I can see if I can find the answers, but I don't know off the top of my head if I can answer them now. So I just highlighted a few of these clocks. That display case that you see along the top of the screen is sort of um, what greets you when you walk in the building. It spans the back of the building that you face when you come into the room. Um, lots and lots of clocks, very, very full. Um, the burst lot wall clock was um, that you see on the left-hand side. I, I showed the face of it and then the full clock next to it. That's the oldest clock that we have identified in the collection, um, circa 1710 to 1747. The reason that's so specific is because it is identified as being made in that town and that town only bore that name until 1747. Um, so it was fairly easy to narrow down. It's beautiful. Um, it, as far as I know, it works just like I think most or all of the clocks do, but we don't wind them because it would be very noisy in that room if we did. Um, another style that I wanted to highlight was the um, mantle clock that has the cast bronze figurine on it. Um, those were very popular in the late 19th century, mid to late 19th century, and um, lots of clock makers made them different styles. Um, this is a hunter with his two dogs sitting there and it's made by a New Haven clock company and they made a whole lot of these. Um, to the right of that, the Napoleon third clock, um, that's a really popular style. It's beautiful if you see it in person. It's pretty big. It has um, mother of pearl inlay and it's really decorative and those were very popular in the 19th century, mid 19th century to late. Um, the nautical clock I like, I just think it's sort of a classic um, ship's clock. Uh, that was That was of course made in Boston, where else? And uh, that was early 20th century. And then I wanted to give you sort of an array of more of those figural mantle clocks that um, Charlie seemed to like a lot. He had many of those. Um, just a little aside on that, my mother had one and he really, really kept after her for years until she finally sold it to him. Some more of the clocks. Um, if you look in the upper right hand corner, that cuckoo clock is behind our bar. It's quite large. It's a um, Black Forest style uh, German cuckoo clock that uh, Phyllis and Charlie tr traveled quite a bit. And I'm sure every trip he was looking for new acquisitions for his um, collection. And that was one of them. Um, then of course, there's a banjo clock next to that to its left that has a nautical sort of scene if you can see that underneath there. And then another mantle clock that's decorative that of course appropriately has a horse since we're on a horse farm. Um, I really liked this grandfather clock, even though it's missing a little finial. Um, that gave me the ability uh, with just a little information that's on the face to find out um, the date and just identify the, the clock maker as being the right one. Um, he was uh, in some directories um, in that town in Durham in the late 1840s to mid 1850s as a clock maker. So I think I hit the nail on the head with that one. There's a hunt scene on top of the face there. It's pretty classic. Mm -hmm. Circa 1850, the whole, the whole thing. And it's a full size, but not super tall um, grandfather style clock. The one on the left is not an antique. That's the only thing that's not an antique that I'm gonna highlight. My cousin, Chris, one of the owners, um, made that in his wood shop and it sits above the staircase and it's really, really large and beautiful. And that one does work and is usually wound as far as I know. Um, a little nod to my title, the locks, <laughs> since I did the clocks, there are lots of locks and other things hanging about the ceiling. Um, Charlie did that when he started to display his things for his friends and family, and it was a good idea and it stuck. So um, uh, Chris and Kurt actually moved some of the things up a little bit, um, sort of to make room, but you can view everything from above and it's, it's sort of the largest display case that we have is the ceiling. So some of these things that you see are the clocks I'm sorry, the locks and their keys, um, those brass hanging scales in various sizes from very tiny to really large. And the same goes with the traps. Some of these traps are for, I, I assume rodents. They're very, very small up to the bear size trap, which hangs above the staircase. That one is big and the kids really like that and ask about that quite a bit. So here's our bar. It's a busy little place. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things there. The, um, the bar itself, the countertop of the bar is made up of these display cases that are filled with Native American artifacts. This picture um, doesn't really give you an idea of the scale, but if I were standing behind the bar, my head would be uh, below the um, 
um, the weights on the cuckoo clock there, probably I'd be about there and I'm five nine. So um, it's a big, big bar. And there's a lot of eclectic things behind it. You can see those locks up at the top. You can see um, beer steins directly behind the bar there. And then all along the ceiling, there's all kinds of things that I'll give you a close up view. There is a ceremonial headdress up here in the upper right hand side. And just below that, you can see a portrait that uh, Phyllis England painted of her husband, Charlie, as he overlooks all of his collections being um, enjoyed, surrounded by his, his goodies there. So here's some of the things that you can see behind the bar. So we have a national cash register, cash register that is from the 1920s and it, it definitely works. We don't bring it up the way you would uh, because the, the um, numeric values are a little off for us, but we do use it and it makes a great cha-ching noise when you open it. Um, and that's a, that's a really interesting item that people ask about frequently. And if you look up to the right of that, um, you can see some cast iron cobbler shoe repair stands, which of course you need behind a bar for some reason, but they are really visually cool. There are three of them. There's only two in the picture, but there are three of them that sort of grade up in height. Um, and those are from about the 1890s. There's a spittoon, which every good bar should have um, next to a nice bowler hat there. And the spittoon is, is stamped with all famous five cent cigars. And that spittoon um, was produced around the turn of the century, but was also reproduced later. But I think this is an early one after looking at it pretty closely. I don't think it's the 1960s reproduction. And then of course, there's a saddle there. That saddle is uh, jockey's training and exercise saddle. It's very small, very old um, and lightweight because it's for racing horses. Some of the other things I wanted to give you a close up view, um, just kind of a variety. If you see that stoneware uh, bottle here on the on the main picture on the bottom left hand corner, that was actually made by the Wadworth and Company Brewery. Um, I don't know if Charlie got that abroad, but he did get a lot of things when they traveled. So that brewery is still in operation and it was founded in 1875. It's in Wiltshire, which makes me think he probably got that in England because he got some other things in Wiltshire as well. Um, so that uh, along with the um, wooden stoppers, which I think are really cool. Uh, they sort of, some of those are, um, they do have uh, articulated parts and can move, I think, but not all of them. And those, um, I did a little research. I'm not 100% that they're all from Henri, but I saw a couple that looked like they had to be. Um, there was only, you know, this, this company and another one that I found that were doing these at that time, but they did them for years, almost 50 years. And then there's, um, of course, the Olympia uh, Steins and Mug Style Stein. Those were actually, um, they outsourced their signs. They're a Washington state company. And these were made in, in Brazil, but there were some that were made in Germany as well. And then there's another stoneware bottle, a little hard to read, but that one was um, uh, ginger beer. And that was also made in England. This is one of our favorites. Um, we get a lot of questions about this. It's not the oldest nor the most valuable in the collection, but it's so cool. This stein, has a chunk of the Berlin Wall glued to the top. And um, it kind of tells the history through the pictures on the stein. So you see on the right, uh, 13th of August, 1961, the wall goes up. And then the fall of the wall in 1989, on the 9th of November with this sort of freedom feel with the, um, the eagle and the red, white, and blue stripes, kind of a nod to us, I think, a little bit. It looks sort of American. Um, so the, the company that made this was not the only company making these, um, but they offered uh, a picture of the man getting the chunks off the wall as, as uh, sort of provenance and then a certificate of authenticity that came along with it. It's really a fun piece and it's really a, a really great chunk of history. Pardon my pun. Some other things you'll see around the bar are taps, wooden, wooden, wooden and brass. And then I have on here some wooden shoes <laughs> and they're next to a little wooden butter press, um, which just happens to be back there. The tap, the brass tap on the left is a cool story. Uh, Chris found that, or Chris and Kurt one, found that um, in a, an outbuilding in a box and it was sort of oxidized and um, he cleaned it up and was able to see what was stamped on it and then did some research on it and found out the history. And it's actually a local company, a foundry in Cincinnati that made this 
this tap circa 1900. Hard to date the tap because the company was in business for a long time. But um, he found out some cool information about the owner who was um, from Scotland originally. He came to the US settling in Cincinnati. He was not German, surprisingly, Scottish. And he was, um, he was uh, one of the people that helped organize the independent Highland Guards who were part of the Ohio 5th Infantry in the Civil War. So that's a really cool little piece of the history of the man who made this, this tap possible. Um, I looked in the directory and found an ad and he ran this ad for many, many years, um, just as sort of nod to, to his work and his importance. Sadly, um, Robert Kirkup um, fell down the stairs and died in 1924 at his foundry, but he was 92 and still working. So pretty, pretty tough Scotsman. So that's the history of just one piece. So this, this building is full of stories. Um, if you look to the right, um, you'll see these wooden barrel taps. Um, I tried to date these, but it was really difficult because they were made in the same way for many, many years. Um, sort of a rustic style, but, but highly used. Um, those would be used on, uh, on barrels, typically to tap the barrels. And you can see where you turn the top. There's a couple different styles there, but you basically turn it to open the tap and turn it back to close it. Um, and then of course our cute little no bloody swearing sign which is important. One of our biggest things, most popular collections is the Native American collection, which is in that bar that I showed you and also another display case that's near the bar. Um, I, I was able to ask some folks that I know as experts about the ages of some of these. And some of them um, were identified as being Clovis culture, which are paleo Indians, very, very, very old, thousands of years old. Um, and, and they actually span this really long time period up into Lake Woodland for sure, and even further forward from there. Some of you who may be enthusiasts of um, understanding Native American culture in our area, especially the Ohio Valley, may already know this, but Boone County has lots and lots of mounds um, that were burial mounds, and they were um, built on site where, the, where these, um, these uh, societies lived in Boone County many years ago. They predate um, all of all of the European settlers, of course, but um, artifacts are still being found in our area. And there were people collecting for years and years. And so Charlie actually, when he started getting some interest in this type of collecting, um, he would find people who had collections that they had gathered themselves and he would buy the whole thing. And so we actually have several collections identified um, with whom they came from and where they were found. Uh, a lot of them are from Petersburg, North Bend. We have some, I think, from Owen County. And in that smaller display case that you'll see in the bottom corner, there are a few that were found on our farm, um, which is a real direct tie <laughs> to our area. Um, I took pictures of some of my favorites. You can see in that middle picture at the top, there is an eagle. Um, I just think it's good napping work and um, it's interesting to see. Uh, the, the points for the arrowheads range from very, very tiny and sharp to, to very big. Um, we also have some, some farming tools and domestic tools. There is a, um, a big mortar and pestle sort of grain um, grinding tool that sits right in the middle of our case that people are always interested in. Um, and you see those decorative beads that are um, on the right hand side that appear to be stone, but I think looking at them a little closer that they may have been cross cuts from fossilized plants, plant matter. You can see some of the striping there. Um, if, if you've ever seen those fossilized plant stems, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, moving away from the bar and the Native American into uh, the 20th century, this piece has gotten so many questions. It used to hang above, um, up from the ceiling and people would come to the bar and say, is that a gun or a camera? And the answer was always yes. <laughs> um, and just to be a little clearer, it was not a gun. It doesn't shoot bullets, but it's used like a gun. It's designed to feel and um, move like a gun, um, a machining gun. Um, and it was produced by the Japanese and was used during World War II and, and prior to, a little bit prior to World War II as well as a training tool. So 
Um, it is missing a piece on the lens side, which is on the right hand side that it came out from the lens. It was like a plastic sort of piece. Um, but you can see it has a crank like a machining tool would, a machine gun would, a handle where you would hold it, a, a very gun like trigger mechanism and a sight. Um, so it's understandable that people would think it was a gun. So it was used um, sort of to improve accuracy. Um, you put the film in and crank the film and it can shoot 10 frames per second. Uh, they could use it for training and for reconnaissance. And um, they would approach in their plane the sites that they planned on shooting. And when you would take the picture, that was an indication um, you're engaging the film that you're shooting, as in shooting bullets. Um, so it was, it was reviewed later, the film was, to sort of help these guys um, become more accurate. And if you look um, at that picture on the left, you can see just another angle. It's a very heavy piece. And um, these were designed to be mounted on the planes. Um, so they would either be mounted on the wing area or they would be um, mounted sort of on a gunnery position on the side when there was a, a gunner there who could run it. If they were on the wing and the pilot was operating, it was using cables. Um, they were manufactured by um, a company that became Konica. Um, and some of the best known planes from the war, if you are a World War II enthusiast, you'll recognize some of these. Um, they used this training tool. So I wanted to just highlight those because I know there are a lot of World War II enthusiasts out there. So a nod to you, if that's you. Um, this is the first plane that I highlighted um, was a Navy carrier torpedo bomber, a Tenzin. Um, Allied code name for this plane was Jill and it was flown during the Battle of the Philippine Seas, Okinawa and the first Kamikaze missions. And they used the training camera. Also, the Allied code name Kate um, B5N Navy Type 97 Carrier Attack Bomber. So at least 144 of these planes took part in the attack on Pearl Harbor, which makes us wish that that camera was not so good at what it does. Um, but they were there, as was the, um, the carrier bomber that you see on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, this plane apparently was responsible for the destruction of more Allied, um, uh, oops, sorry. I've, got ahead of myself, ships than any other plane. Um, so it was pretty effective. The Zero plane on the left, uh, most of us who've ever watched a World War II movie know that that's, uh, that was a pretty famous um, fighter plane. And a lot of dog fights. Um, it was actually so good at what it did that um, the Allied forces tried to figure it out for years and they couldn't get their hands on one until two years into the war. It had a, a uh, dogfight kill ratio of 12 to one. And then they were flown also um, throughout the war and there were many hundreds at, at the attack on Pearl Harbor. That's probably the most famous of these planes to those of us who don't study World War II history as much. Um, the one on the right was not actually um, used in World War II with one exception. It had sort of become obsolete, but the Japanese decided near the end of the war they were gonna throw everything they could at the Allied forces, and it was used as a kamikaze plane, and the Allied code for that was Anne. Um, you're going to want to remember this name. That's just a hint, and that's all I'm going to say about that. But this is a really cool collection. So this came from a shipwreck. Um, Charlie and Phyllis were traveling, and they were in England, and Charlie sniffed out those antiques everywhere he went, and this collection um, caught his notice from a private sale. So this ship was actually built in, by, Fran by the French Navy and launched in 1744. But the British took it away, captured it in 1747, and used it for just over a decade. Um, it wrecked in the Sullent Waterway near Portsmouth, and that was one of those ship uh, graveyards sort of like the Outer Banks of um, North Carolina. So there were lots and lots of ships that wrecked there. This wreckage of this particular ship wasn't discovered until 1979. And people were going, divers were going, independent private divers were going down and getting artifacts regularly until it became a protected site, which it is now. Um, so that's been, that's been shut down. But uh, I guess to our advantage in Charlie's, he was able to buy some of those early artifacts that were recovered. 
If you look on the left-hand side, that, that picture, there are musket balls, pistol shot. Um, those all came from the ship, as did all the other artifacts you see. There's some rigging um, that you can see on the bottom right-hand side. I think the crosscut is from some of the wood on the ship. Um, all of this collection is in a, um, a case that is very secure, so it, I'm not able to get around the glass. So it made it kind of difficult for me to photograph things for you to see. But um, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see just at the bottom, there's some gold pieces there. Those are actually doubloons that were pressed to um, sort of mimic these uh, buttons that were on some admiral, admiral's uniform. So it's kind of an interesting piece there. That's a super interesting um, collection, the HMS Invincible. Here's another one. I told you earlier that, that Charlie um, went to Wiltshire. Um, I knew that because they had this collection that he got while he was there. Um, lots and lots of uh, imperial coins from the, Rome, the various uh, phases of the Roman Empire when they were in England um, were discovered there. They're still being discovered. I think in 2016, there was a, a Roman villa um, that was discovered under someone's garden. So they're still finding things. Um, but these dates, you know, I think the earliest or maybe, oh gosh, I don't even know. Maybe the, the one in the bottom right hand side looks to be maybe the oldest. And all of these are um, depictions of the emperors at the time, with the exception of the pottery shards and the tile that you see on the bottom there. So that's probably also one of the most interesting and old, oldest collections. This one is not the oldest nor the most collectible, but it's really got a cool story. So um, Charlie found, or someone discovered this, this uh, doctor's buggy that was in an old barn, but it was walled in. And the story was that the doctor that had owned the buggy was on call and he died suddenly from a heart event and his family just couldn't take it. They walled everything up so they wouldn't have to look at it or maybe they wanted to preserve it. Um, but at some point, um, it was discovered and Charlie bought it. So he's got it in, uh, or we, we now have it in a corner case that has some of the doctor's tools and some other um, um, things from the same era there. You can see some of the tools in the seat of the buggy. So that's just a cool story. Some other kind of incidental things that, um, that you can find in, in that building are, there's a Victorian era pump organ. I can tell you it does work. Um, there is a banjo um, that you see on the right-hand side that was from the 20s. It's autographed and it has some, some artists did a little work on there of a flapper girl and a guy playing football with one of those old helmets. Um, so it's kind of a neat piece. These cast iron pieces that you see are in a display case um, and are several among many. Um, a lot of banks, um, that local one, the Forest Deposit Bank is a little iron bank. I don't know when that was made, but it's pretty cool. And then this little stove, um, if you look at that business card that's sitting right in front of it, that'll give you an idea of the scale of that stove. It's actually super, super small, but it has these little pots and pans and little spoons and they all are separate pieces. They're not, it's not just one solid piece. You can open and close the doors. And that was used as a salesman sample, not a toy, although I've played with it. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, and you can see on one of the, uh, one of the banks down there in the bottom right hand side was um, a Nixon Ag Agnew um, campaign promotion item. If you can't see it, it's right over there on the left hand side of that photo. We also have a bunch of woodworking tools. There are planes everywhere, um, hand planes everywhere. Another um, use of the business card to show you how tiny some of them are up to very, very large. Um, there was a, a, this router plane that you see in the upper right hand side, I was able to date the patent on it by the, the stamped number that was on it and it was patented in 1901. Um, and there's a variety of those um, woodworking tools and planes in that case there, but there are more throughout the building as well. This really cool vise that you see in the bottom right hand side um, was in uh, a collection of things that came from a local family. Um, they owned it for three generations and the most recent generation was about in his 90s. And so that's a very, very old piece and very large, um, really cool. Here's the miscellaneous things that we have. There's so much more to see in this place, but I had to, I had to highlight some of the things that, that catch people's eyes a lot. Um, 
The marbles that you see there, that's not the whole collection. <laughs> that's just part of it. That's a kind of a standard size display case that um, hits you above waist if you're an adult. Um, that big marble, the blue one in the middle is big. It's probably two and a half inches in diameter or more. And there are some other ones. There are some stone marbles in there that are really cool. And then there are jars of marbles up along the ceiling ledge that line the wall along the front of the building. So we are not gonna lose our marbles. We have a lot of marbles. Um, there's also a whole lot of fishing lures. This is just a sample of what's in a, an, an entire display case full of these. And if there are some fishermen out there, I'm sure you all would be able to identify some of these. I didn't even try. Um, there were so many and it was hard to, hard to get um, that specific with those because I think some of these are quite old. Um, some of the other displays just have a variety of things. Like you see the personal items in the bottom um, left-hand side, you know, harmonica, some, some glasses, some sewing things, some cufflinks. Um, it just looks like somebody emptied out their pockets from 1890 and put them in our case. And so that's kind of a, a general overview. Um, I wanted to offer to answer questions for sure, but I also wanted to offer my email address because I may not know the answers to some of your questions. And so I'm happy to follow up if you'd like, and I can leave this up um, for a minute and, and let you all get that information if you would like to um, copy it down. But I also wanted to revisit the quiz question. Um, I, the quiz question is, what is the name of the vessel that the shipwreck collection came from? And I'm gonna go ahead and type it in the chat feature as well. And if anybody wants Great. to answer that question, feel free to answer it. Oh, we've already got an answer before I even typed in it. Oh my gosh. I know, I was really <laughs> obvious, wasn't I? That, was quick. <laughs> yeah. that hint might've helped a little, I don't know. Maybe so, maybe so. <laughs> It looks like and if there's anything that anybody would like to see uh, again throughout these slides, I'm happy to, to go back to one of those slides. Um, um, it looks like Joy Carrar, Car Carrillo, I don't know how to say Carrillo, um, got it correct, the quiz question correct. With Wonderful, congratulations. The HMS Invincible. So congratulations, Joy. If you could go ahead and uh, private message me on the chat, um, your address, um, I will go ahead and we will get your prize sent out to you. So congratulations. And yes, yay. But I, I do want to, Hillary, I wanted to say there were some comments and stuff that I wanted to um, Great. let you know. Let's see. Let's go back. Let's see. Um, Natalie Ellis commented that she got married at, El, at the little yay. house and she's so excited to see this. Great. Um, Patrick Raverty said, our daughters learned to ride at the farm. Every afternoon, Charlie would have happy hour. Yes, he did. <laughs> Someone asked in the beginning too. There were there was a. It says what's a hame because there was a. It said type of. Oh, I was wondering if okay. it's horse collar. Let me see if I can find a picture for you. There's there's a picture. Um, gosh, I think it's kind of a small picture, but if you look on the right hand side where all the tables are on that back wall, it's like a a horse collar with the metal things coming out of it. Okay. That is a hame. Okay. For pulling, for horses pulling things. So that's what it's for. Oh, and Michelle Truitt, she says she remembers talking about grandfather clocks with him. Hmm. Yeah. He knew so much. Um, after he passed away, not only did he leave all of these collectibles, but he left a veritable library of, of literature and, and books about collecting these items. So he really did his homework. And you have to remember this is before the internet, um, largely before eBay even. So um, he went to auctions and um, like I said, with the clock that he bought from my mom, he did not give up easily. If he wanted to buy something, he would wheel and deal until he got it. Wow. So um, someone pointed out that maybe the clocks need to be kept wound up or they'll stop working. Is that true? I don't know. Um, that's going to be a question that probably I will have to find the answer for. I know that they occasionally wind some of them, but we don't keep them constantly wound because of the noise level in the room okay because if they were all wound then they would all be yeah. really super noisy gotcha um uh janine crimebrink um she commented that i guess on the fossils she said yes. sections of crinoid stems in our fossils they were used as beads 
Yay. So my, my inclination was close, huh? That's what they looked like to me is some sort of plant that was, you know, bisected, but how clever for them to make them into beads. Yes. And Frederick Warren said he had a, he comment, he, or question about the, the camera. He said, yes. why was the camera gun collected and how was it acquired? Well, I really don't know the answer to that. So some of these things, um, Charlie uh, traveled a lot, like I said, um, and, and would acquire things that way. I used this actually, I, I borrowed this for a display at the library and it just happened to be around the time that we had um, World War II veterans speaking. And there was a man there who was, um, he was Japanese and he was identifying it and he was fascinated with it. So it was really an interesting exchange. I have no idea how he got it. Um, I'm sure that there were many of them because this company was not the only company that made this type of training tool, um, but they did make a lot of them, I think. And they were mounted on so many planes that there probably are some out there. If you go online and just look for Japanese gunnery camera, you'll find a whole lot of answers. Okay. Um, he also asked if Charlie collected all this stuff for his own pleasure, or was he intending to share it with the public at some time? He did share. I mean, he, he sort of built that building kind of as a private showcase. Um, he would sit in there with his friends, you know, just in his downtime and drink beer and tell stories, I think. But, but he also, um, you know, like I said about the things that were hanging on the ceiling, he had put those up there, um, you know, many long, long time ago, right after the building was built so, so that everybody could see all this stuff. And he did have private parties there and we had a lot of family parties there. So it's always been sort of a um, showcase for all of that collectible stuff. Great. And are, do you guys offer tours of the carriage house? At the moment, the only tours that happen are when people are coming in to view the space to rent it. But I think they're, we've discussed it many times and how best to do that. If you um, wanna contact, the carriage house, the information is there. Um, there are often people there. So sometimes just even a stop in um, is, is possible to arrange, but I don't wanna make any promises because I'm not the person that makes that decision, but please feel free to contact. Okay. And then um, someone else asked if you were interested in, in increasing your collections. I don't know the answer. We don't have a lot of room. I know that, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna even attempt to answer that because I think that Kurt and Chris would be better, <laughs> better um, sources for the answer of that because they are the ones that that own it. Okay, those are all the questions and comments that I've had. Um, well, Natalie Ellis, she did say she loved it. Loved the present. Oh, congratulations uh, on your wedding. <laughs> yes, and whatever that was. Yeah. And um, if anybody else has any questions or comments they'd like to add, um, type them in the chat here and we can get to them. Or um, also, I mean, you can also email Hillary at H. Oh, I think right. Way. But, I'm sorry. I did that. I did that accidentally. Yeah. Well, H. Delaney. Just there. Yes. H. Delaney at bcpl.org. There you go. And that's my, my, I'm also at the main library in Burlington. So I work in local history. You're welcome to stop by anytime. Um, we, um, we usually have somebody there that can summon me if I'm not available. Um, but yeah, so this, this is really honestly just scraping the surface of what is in this building. So um, I, I didn't want to overload everybody. And also it was too hard to, to decide <laughs> on more and what to put in there. So. Can I ask you, Hillary, what is your favorite piece in his collection? Um, gosh, I don't have one favorite. I do like, I think the gunnery camera is sort of fascinating. I thought that but was I also really, really like um, the, uh, the cast iron stuff a lot. And there's way more of that. That's right here. Um, there's much more of this than what I showed you. There's a sort of a double-sided display case of cast iron things. Um, that are really interesting. And I do, I do also like the Native American stuff because it's, it's a big topic of conversation. If you're in there, everyone wants to ask about it, so. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for this. If it, I guess if anyone, if no one else has any other questions, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, let's see here. We, I do have some ending notes here. Uh, let's get this. Um, I just want to let everybody know that the, for more Northern Kentucky history throughout the week, we have um, a lot of history on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel at BC Museum. So please like and subscribe. Um, we now also have all of our past Northern Kentucky History Hour presentations on our website, as well as on our YouTube channel. And those can all be found at bcmuseum.org. Um, I want to thank all of our sponsors again and our supporters of BCM. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you. Thank you, everyone joining us, the staff, trustees, and members of the museum. There will not be a Northern Kentucky History Hour next week because we're continuing our biweekly schedule. But we will be back on Wednesday, March 23rd with Greg Harper, artist and former uh, BCM executive director, who will highlight his works that are now on display in, um, in an exhibit we have called Abracadabra. So be sure to come in and check them out, as well as we have Spirit Riders. We have an amazing extended Harlan Hubbard exhibit and a Bengals exhibit, Who Day History. And those are all on display through the end of April. So until next time, everyone take care and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone. And thank you so much, Hillary, for a wonderful thank day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I had so much fun. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Bye.